right, it's 11 a.m. So, Boker Tov, everybody, Erev Tov in Israel. A pleasure to welcome back Shuli for part three, the Dead Sea Scrolls today. As she mentioned last week, lots to do, lots to pay attention. So, let's get started. Vakasha, and nice to see everybody. And Shuli, let's, let's take it away. Okay, hi everyone. So we have, like I said, lots to do. Uh, and I am guessing there will be lots of questions. So please, please put them all in the chat. This is an enormous, enormous topic. And I'm going to start with a disclaimer, which is that you could take at least a year in university uh, courses on this topic. You, there are, you can, and there are many people who have made this their life's work and have uh, you know, PhD and books. This is a taste of a taste, the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Okay, so if we haven't covered everything you want to know, don't worry because uh, we won't. But we are going to be trying to get a little bit of a, a picture of what is this story of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Why is it such a big deal? Okay? Why is it so important? And what does it tell us about the time period we've been discussing for the past few weeks? And that's the Second Temple period. So First of all, let's try and just suggest why is this such a big deal? First of all, when this was discovered, as we're going to tell the story in a, in a few minutes, in 1947, the oldest Torah text before this was the Aleppo Codex. Okay, So if you know about the Aleppo Codex, you know it was written give or take uh, 1,000, 1,100 years ago in Tiberias. And it's not even a Torah scroll. It's a, it's a book. It's an extremely important book. But that was the oldest one, something that was about 1,000 years old. This more than doubles that, OK? Even if we're only talking about the Torah text or the Tanakh texts, this goes back 2,200 years. So that's a huge leap and a hugely important idea in terms of Misora, right? In terms of tradition, that we have texts that are so like the text we have today and are so old, okay? Besides that, as we're going to see, we have sectarian works, works that we have never seen before, that no one knew existed, uh, and that give us a window into this time period. And perhaps most importantly, um, this time period, and we're going to see, we're talking about give or take 150 before the Common Era to the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70. This is a missing link in the beginnings of Christianity. This is a missing link in rabbinic Judaism. It's a time period that we don't have a lot of texts that, that tell us about this time. And that's why these texts are going to be so significant for us. Okay, so that's uh, just to give us a, a little bit of a beginning. Where are we going today? Okay, so we are going, very simple, really one place. Okay, we're gonna go down to Qumran, okay. Qumran is in the Judean desert. Okay, it's on the northern edge of the Dead Sea. Uh, as you come from Jerusalem, it's actually very close to Jerusalem. It'll take you with no traffic about a half hour. Okay, coming from the heights of Jerusalem from about 800 meters, right, 2,400 feet above sea level, going down towards the Dead Sea, 400 meters, 1,200 feet below sea level. So you have this incredible descent from Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea. Okay, the other thing that you have that you can see today, but it was much, much stronger uh, in the time uh, of the Second Temple, is that there are cliffs along, all along here, right? There are cliffs. And why do I say it was stronger in Second Temple times? Because today the Dead Sea is shrinking. It's been shrinking for over 50 years, right? But then the Dead Sea came up to the edge of the cliffs. So really, when you came to Qumran, that was pretty much the end of the line. If you wanted to go further, you had to get in a boat in order to sail down further on the Dead Sea, okay? The Judean desert has classically been the place for not only shepherds, right, and, and people who are out there with their flocks and seekers of God, right? Think about King David before he becomes king. Think about Jeremiah the prophet. But it's been a place of refuge. It's a place where you get away. And it's a great place to get away because it is a way, right? It's in the desert. It's hard to find people out there. But it's not that away, right? It's a half hour drive from Jerusalem. So think about it as a half a day's walk, maybe more because of the uphill. We're not, we're, we're getting away from it all, but we're not that far away. And that's going to be important because we're going to see that our people of Qumran 
definitely have knowledge and contact with Jerusalem. So that's just to give us a sense of where we are. Okay, the story of the discovery is, is a pretty well-known story, but we will tell it uh, quickly. By the way, the Bedouin in the picture has nothing to do with the Bedouin who found the scrolls. He's just a nice looking Bedouin. Okay, um, in 1947, a, uh, two Bedouin young men from the Tamira tribe, right, the tribe right near where Qumran is, um, they lost a goat. And they, the goat is a good climber, right? The goat scampers up the cliffs. Um, and the next day, the goat is gone. The next day, one of them comes back uh, and he wants to go see where the goat has gone. And he climbs up the cliff too and he sees a cave. Right? And he's curious, maybe the goat went in the cave. Maybe the cave is you know, uh, something interesting to explore. It's very dark. He doesn't have any way to light it up. So what he does is he throws a rock into the cave to see if it'll scare the goat out. It doesn't scare any goats out, but it makes a sound. It hits something. So he feels his way into the cave. He feels around and what does he feel? a jar, right? A, a clay jar, which is what you're seeing here. These are uh, in the museum. These are actually, I think, in the museum in Jordan, but we have them here in the Israel Museum as well. Okay. Um, this Bedouin boy's name is Muhammad Adib. He takes the jar out. He drags it out into the light. He opens it up and he sees inside is a scroll. Now he doesn't know how to read and he definitely doesn't know how to read this script, but he thinks maybe it's valuable enough that his father will be less angry with him about the lost goat. So he brings it home, shows it to his father. His father doesn't know what it is either, but they decide that they are going to take it to somebody who might indeed know what it is. Okay. By the way, just to uh, be a spoiler alert, this this is the first of 11 caves. Ultimately, they found 10 jars in this cave, in cave number one. One of them had three different scrolls inside it, but we're getting ahead of our story, okay? Um, they bring the scrolls and the jars to Bethlehem. They go to do antiquities dealers who are not particularly interested in this. They don't know what it is. They don't really care. Uh, and then they find a cobbler whose name is Kando, Khalil Iskander Shahin. And he says, okay, I'll take it, right? If nothing else, it's, you know, it's, uh, it might be useful in my shoemaking business, right? Very, very horrible thought, right? And he buys them, okay? Buys ultimately seven scrolls. Four of these scrolls are sold to an Eastern Orthodox priest named Mar Samuel, who's in the old city. They are sold for $110, okay, which is unbelievable. Okay, but three of them are sold to this gentleman. Now, uh, Kondo knows this man. This is Eliezer Sukenik. Professor Eliezer Sukenik uh, is maybe most famous, not so fair, but maybe he's most famous for being Yigael Yadin's father. Yigael Yadin, of course, very, very famous. If you know one archaeologist from Israel, you know Yigael Yadin, right? He excavated in Masada, in Chatzor, in Megiddo, but this is his father who is just as important in his own right, one of the founding fathers of the archaeology department in Hebrew University, uh, one of the editors of the biblical encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia Mikra'it. He dug in the ancient synagogue in Beit Alpha, very, very significant archaeologist. And he goes out to Bethlehem to see what the story is. And he sees these scrolls, which up until now, nobody has any idea what they are. And of course, he can read them, because as we're going to see in a moment, they are written in beautiful, clear Hebrew uh, in the, the Ketav Ashuri, the, the square letters that we use today. And he recognizes it immediately. He says, this is the book of Isaiah, Sefer Yeshayahu. I know what this is. And he realizes that based on the way the script looked, because realizes this is in 1947, we've already found ancient inscriptions. Based on the way the letters look, he believes it goes back to Second Temple times. And he is elated. He is so excited. And he goes back to Jerusalem. He hasn't purchased the scrolls yet. He will. Right? But he goes back to Jerusalem and he comes into the city and he sees people are out in the street. They're partying. They're going crazy and he thinks, what, did they hear about the scrolls? They didn't hear about the scrolls. It's November 29th, 1947. The United Nations has just voted to create the state of Israel. They voted on partition. And Eliezer Sukenik comes back. It's such a beautiful combination of circumstances, having got regards from the Jews of 2,200 years ago to find out that Israel is going to have a state. Okay, uh, eventually, 
he buys these uh, these three scrolls, okay? And here's one of them, the Isaiah scroll. I apologize, I didn't make it bigger. We'll see some other scrolls a little later. Uh, and you can see them. If you go to the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem, it used to be that the original Isaiah scroll was displayed in the middle. Uh, then they saw that was not so good for its preservation. So they put a copy there, um, which looks just like the real thing. But you can see it and you can see that it is written in beautiful, perfect Hebrew letters, okay? fascinating thing, by the way. Um, first of all, some of the scrolls are written not only in Hebrew, but in Aramaic, but the Tanakh scrolls, the biblical scrolls are written in Hebrew. In the Ketav Ashuri, in the script that we use today, with one exception, right? One word that is consistently written in the old Hebrew, in the Ketav Ivri Atik, the, the script that they used in first temple times. What word is that? The Tetragrammaton, Yud Kei Vav Kei, the name of God is written in the old letters. Why? That's a great question, right? We have two possible answers, right? One answer is they thought the old script was holier and that's why they wrote God's name in the old script. The other answer is the opposite. They thought the old script wasn't holy anymore. Better to write God's name in that old script. Either way, they make a distinction and they write God's name in that script. We found, ultimately, we haven't gotten finished with the story of the discovery of the scrolls, but just again, a spoiler, we have found pieces, not the entirety like the Isaiah scroll, but pieces of every book of the Bible, except for one so far, okay? Uh, and that's the book of Esther. Um, is it because we haven't found it yet? Is it because the writers of these scrolls, the scribes of these scrolls are not great fans of women? Uh, is it because the book of Esther is somewhat later and maybe they didn't put it in their canon? That's a, all of those are fascinating possibilities. Um, but what is even more fascinating, and this is what Professor Lawrence Schiffman, one of the great experts on the scroll says, we're talking about these texts are from the second century before the common era. And we are finding texts from all of the books of the Bible, which seems to indicate that we have a canon by that point, okay? That we know that we have the, the books, the 24 books of the Bible that we have today, they had practically intact by that point. And that's what I'm part of what we're talking about when we talk about this missing link, right? Understanding when does this canon start? We know that we hear discussions about this still in the time of Rabbi Akiva. Should we include Shir Hashirim? Should we not, right? But here we have all of these books. But let's continue with our mystery, okay? The three scrolls are purchased by Sukenik. The four other whole scrolls, okay, are owned by this Mar Samuel. Um, and Sukenik wants them. And he travels back and forth to the old city, negotiating with Mar Samuel on a price. Will he get it? Will he sell it to him for how much? Now, remember, when did this all get started? November 1947. What happens immediately after the United Nations votes on partition? The War of Independence. Okay, so the war is raging in Jerusalem, but Sukenik doesn't care. He wants those scrolls. And he braves the battles and he goes to the old city. But no matter what he does, he cannot convince uh, Mar Samuel to part with the scrolls. And in 1953, Professor Sukenik passes away. But don't worry, because the story does not end there. Okay? A year later, his son, Yigael Yadin, you can see him here, right? He was, uh, besides all his other brilliance, he was a, a decorated uh, army officer, very important in the War of Independence. And in 1954, he travels to New York and someone draws his attention to the advertisement on the left, which every time I read it, it makes me laugh, right? It's a classified ad in the Wall Street Journal. Miscellaneous for sale, the four Dead Sea Scrolls, biblical manuscripts dating back to at least 200 BC are for sale, an ideal gift for an educational or religious institution by an individual or a group. Uh, and of course, Sukenik is overjoyed, uh, not Sukhanik, excuse me, Yadin is overjoyed. He gets a go-between. He doesn't want to go uh, as a representative of the state of Israel. He's worried that they won't sell it to him. So he finds a nice Jew in Brooklyn. There are a couple of them. Uh, and he asks him to be the go-between. Uh, and he wires, you know, the government, can he get the money? He gets the money. He buys these for $250,000, right? A quarter of a million dollars. Remember, Mar Samuel had bought them for $110. Okay, so he, he made a very nice profit. But again, these are priceless. These are, the, you, you cannot imagine how much they are worth. So now we have the four plus the three back in Israel and we need a home for them. Oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and we need a home for them. Um, and that's when in the 60s, okay, uh, Israel builds the Israel Museum, right? It's, it's 
a very significant national museum. And right next to it, or part of it, uh, is what we call the Shrine of the Book, right? Meant to house the, the scrolls that we have. And this was built in 1965. Uh, the architects are Frederick Kiesler and Armand Bartos. Uh, and they build this iconic building, which even if you haven't been to Jerusalem, you've definitely seen pictures of this building. Um, and it's all very, very allegorical, right? If you take a look at the at the buildings themselves on the left, right? And we're gonna see this when we talk about the, the, the works that were discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but you have the black and the white because of main, idea in the sectarian works is this final battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness, between good and evil. Okay, you have the white, which I always think of as a Hershey's kiss, but it's supposed to look like the cover of the of those jars, right? The clay jars. Uh, you have the water, which people, many people think is it was some kind of a primitive 1960s air conditioning. It's not. They knew how to air condition, right? They had a way to climate control the shrine of the book. The water is because, as we're going to see, the people who write these scrolls are obsessed with purity, mikvah, ritual baths. Water is a very big deal for them. So the water is also symbolic. When you go inside the structure, and I'm sure a lot of people here have been there, when you go inside, you walk through a narrow hallway that opens up into this big open area, which of course is under the white dome. Uh, and here you have in the picture on the right, what's supposed to look like the top of, uh, of a Torah scroll, right? That's say Chaim, uh, with, uh, here it's already a facsimile of the Isaiah scroll inside. Um, and one of the ideas that the architects had, and I think it's a beautiful idea, is you have to travel through this narrow hallway until you enter into this broad open area. Maybe only the women here will appreciate this, but it's meant to be an idea of giving birth, right? That you're going through this narrow uh, passageway and then emerging and it's giving birth in the sense of giving birth to rabbinic Judaism, giving birth to Christianity, giving birth, uh, rebirth of the modern state of Israel, right? All these very interesting ideas. Um, when the Israel Museum was redone uh, more than a decade ago, one of the things that was done, well, it wasn't part of the renovation, but it was done around that time, was they brought the model uh, that used to be in the Holy Land Hotel, the model of Second Temple Jerusalem, and placed it right near the shrine of the book, but in a very specific way that you had to turn your back on Jerusalem in order to enter the shrine of the book, which is again, symbolic, right? The people uh, of, uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls turn their back on Jerusalem and go out to the desert. Um, meanwhile, the story continues, right? These seven scrolls are not the only scrolls and everybody knows that there are more. Now, again, time has passed and after 1948, the War of Independence is over. This area of Qumran, in fact, the whole Northern part of the Judean desert is in ha the hands of Jordan. It's not in the hands of Israel, it's in the hands of Jordan under Jordanian control. So Israel Israeli archaeologists have no access to it, but archaeologists from other countries do. And a race be begins between the Bedouin and the archaeologists to find as more caves, more fragments, as much as they can find. Okay? Uh, ultimately, they find 11 caves. This is cave number four over here, the entrance to the cave. Uh, they find 11 caves. They find some more whole scrolls, but many more thousands upon thousands of fragments. Now, the Jordanians uh, are very clever. They pay per, per piece, but they say we're only going to pay for a certain size because they don't want the Bedouin to hack up the pieces even more. But in any case, there are many, many, many fragments. And the question is why, right? It, this is not just normal decomposition. And we think that maybe Roman soldiers when they came and they captured these areas and their anger at the whole situation came and hacked up the scrolls. We really don't know. But here, by the way, you can see in these little fragments in this little one on the bottom, you can clearly see the beautiful Hebrew letters that are down here. Um, some of these scrolls are taken to Jordan but most of them are brought to another site that is under the control of Jordan between 48 and 67. And that's the Rockefeller Museum, this beautiful archeology span museum built by the British in the thirties, now under the control of Jordan. 
in East Jerusalem. Well, not now. Now it's under the control of Israel. I meant between 48 and 67, okay? uh, not far from Damascus Gate. Um, and what Jordan does is they bring all the fragments to these big halls of the Rockefeller Museum. And they assemble an international committee of scholars from the US and Britain and Poland and France and Switzerland and Germany. This international committee, very, very learned, uh, very smart people. There are obviously no Israelis, but there are also no Jews. Okay? There are no Jews on this committee. Um, and the idea is that they really believe that these are biblical texts that are gonna connect to the beginnings of Christianity, what do we need Jews for, right? What they don't understand is that there are so many texts here. Obviously, this is coming from a Jewish milieu. That's number one. But there are so many texts here that are connected to Midrash, to Halakha, to Midrash Halakha, things that these Christian scholars have no idea and no understanding of. Okay? And their job is now to clean, to identify, to put the puzzle together. I always picture it as, you know, take a thousand uh, jigsaw puzzles of a thousand pieces each, put them in a cement mixer and dump them on the floor. That's what these guys have to do. And you can imagine that they, uh, it's a little dysfunctional. <laughs> they don't get along very well. Uh, the, the chief, the editor-in-chief here is this uh, very young John Strugnall. When he starts out, he's very young. Um, and he is an anti-Semite. He's an anti-Semite. He's also a, a drunkard. He has other issues, but he's an anti-Semite. He believes that Judaism has been superseded by Christianity. Uh, and he doesn't want Jews on this committee either. Now, it's all very dysfunctional and nothing is published. Okay? They work for 19 years and yet nothing is published. They, they don't work well. And there's also this fear that what if we find something explosive about the beginnings of Christianity? We don't want to tell that to the world. Now, even after the Six-Day War, much of this is kept under wraps and there is no access to it. Yigal Yadin publishes the Temple Scroll in 1977. It's very clear that these texts connect to Jewish history and to Jewish texts. People want to have more. The Antiquities Authority is dragging their feet. The committee uh, that we talked about is dragging their feet. And in 1991, it takes till 1991, uh, this gentleman on the left here, Ben Sion Wacholder, and a student of his, Martin Abegg, they managed to reconstruct one of the texts through a concordance that they have. And it's published by Herschel Shanks, who is the, head, uh, the editor of the Biblical Archaeological Review. And I, at the same time that they published this text, there's a documentary about the Dead Sea Scrolls on the Nova Channel. And this creates a perfect storm where there's a lot of pressure to publish the text. And finally, the texts are freed in the 90s. Okay? Not very long ago. Today, you can find find all the Dead Sea Scrolls online if you want. It's not hard to find. But up until the 90s, they were under wraps and people did not have access to them. So what are these explosive texts and why don't people want them to be seen? Okay, so basically what we have to understand, and here again, you have another even nicer example of the beautiful Hebrew uh, in the temple scroll here on the bottom. You have three types of texts, okay? Number one, you have biblical books, as we said, pieces of all of them, except for Megillat Esther. The most prominent book, by the way, the one that we have the most fragments of is the book of Psalms, Tehillim. Okay? The, the, uh, the people who wrote these scrolls are very interested in prayer, in Psalms. And by the way, they have certain Psalms that we don't have. Um, and that's, uh, that's a very interesting thing in and of itself. Okay, Now, the biblical books, even though we knew them, are incredibly significant because for two reasons, for why they are the same as our text and for why they are different, okay? On the whole, they are the same. There are very few differences between the texts that we have today and the texts that were discovered. And that's incredible, right? I, whenever I, I teach this to students, I always say, okay, you know, write a grocery list and give it to the person sitting next to you and have them copy it and have the next person copy it. And by the time you get to the fourth copy, you're going to have many, many mistakes, right? And yet Torah scrolls have been copied for centuries upon centuries and are almost completely intact. And that's because of the incredible care that a scribe has to take in copying over Torah scrolls. And yet there are some differences. And that's actually fascinating because there are problems that biblical scholars have had, Book of Isaiah and other places that, that the Psukim don't necessarily make so much sense. We don't understand the words that we're reading. And then suddenly you see it and you see there was a scribal error because we can see the original original text. If you're interested in this, my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Yael Ziegler, talks a lot about this. 
and it's a fascinating subject. So that's one uh, that said, Rabbi Kalman, have her come and speak for you. Um, that's one topic, that's one type of text, okay? Type number two, books that are not in the canon, okay? What we call the pseudepigrapha and the apocrypha, books that are from around the same time as most of the biblical books, but they did not make it into the Jewish Bible. Some of them are in the Christian Bible. Also books that were known Okay, sometimes, by the way, only in Greek or in Aramaic, and now we have them in Hebrew, but not any huge surprises. And then we have the surprise, right, the wild card. And that's number three, sectarian works, works that nobody knew about before they were discovered. And that's where we get to the really unusual story here. Who are these people? What do they believe? What do we know about them from their texts, from their works? And that's where most of the fascinating uh, stuff is being written. Okay, so who's writing these texts and why are they writing them? So we have a lot of different suggestions. The most um, the most common suggestion, the most accepted suggestion, and like I said, there are people who devote their whole careers to this. The most accept accepted suggestion is that the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls are the people who lived in Qumran, and those people are identified with people that are described by Josephus uh, and Philo and Pliny as the Essenes, who, by the way, we have practically perhaps a mention of them in our text, but really almost nothing, okay? Um, and like I said, not everybody agrees with this, but we're gonna go with that because it's the, most, uh, it's the most common answer and it's the most logical answer. Josephus tells us about this group, okay? Now, uh, what does he tell us? Here's a text from the Jewish War, a okay? very famous text. For there are three philosophical sects among the Jews. Okay, that's already our first problem. Josephus is writing his book, The Jewish War, as we're going to see next week when we talk about the Great Revolt. He's writing it for Romans. Okay, he is not writing it for Jews. And Romans don't have halakha, they don't have law. So the main differences that we're gonna see between the groups are actually in law, but he doesn't write about that. He writes about philosophy because that's what Romans can understand. But that's less significant to us, still it's helpful. The followers of the first are the Pharisees, the second, the Sadducees, and the third, which pretends to a severer discipline are called Essenes. These last are Jews by birth and seem to have a greater affection for one another than the other sects have. And now he's gonna tell us about who these guys are, okay? They are ascetic. These Essenes reject pleasure as an evil. They neglect wedlock, okay? They are celibate, but choose other people's children while they are pliable and fit for learning, okay? Because um, they think of women as lascivious, go on, okay? So they are celibate, they are ascetic, they are communal. These men are despisers of riches and so very communicative, this is an old translation, right? They, they live in a community as raises our admiration, nor is there anyone to be found among them who has more than another, all right? So, so far we've got similarities to monks, we've got similarities to kibbutzniks, right? Which one is it? It could be a little bit of both, okay? Um, number four, they have no one certain city, but many of them dwell in every city, okay? That's Josephus. We're going to talk about Qumran, but it seems there were scenes in other places. And in number five, he tells us about their daily um, routine, right? Uh, which involves a lot of prayer, a lot of purity and work, right? As for their piety towards God, it is very extraordinary. Before sunrises, they speak not a word about profane matters, but put up certain prayers, which they have received from their forefathers. After this, everyone are sent away to exercise some of those arts wherein they are scaled, in which they labor with great diligence till the fifth hour after which they assemble together in one place and they bathe their bodies in cold water, right? While they're wearing white, white veils, also interesting, right? Um, purification, mikvah, very big deal in Bayit Shani in Second Temple times, they change it a little bit. After this purification is over, um, they go into the dining room, they eat together, right? So we have community eating, ritual bathing before the eating, prayers, work, that's their routine, according to Josephus. Now, this, uh, what's going on here, right? Who are these people? What do they have to do with other Jews? So uh, the title is, is stolen from a, a colleague in graduate school many, many years ago. It's just a fun title. Um, what can I say? Um, if you were to come across a Jew 
in second temple times, right? 2000 years ago, you're walking down the street in Jerusalem and you come across uh, a Jewish man or Jewish woman and you say to them, who are you? What are you? And he'll say to you, oh, of course I'm a Jew, right? But if you probe a little deeper, do you believe in the authority of the rabbis? Are you are a priest, a Kohen? Do you think that the, the, the temple is legitimate? There are a lot of things that are underlying. Everybody sees themselves as the true Jews, but there is no one kind of uh, unified division of Jews that we would say, this is a Jew, right? You have the Pharisees who accept the authority of the rabbis. You have the Sadducees who don't accept the authority of the rabbis. They have differences in, in their beliefs about what's going to happen after you die. They have differences in their interpretation of halacha, but they each see themselves as the true Jews. And this is where we have this, this great quote from Shia Cohen, a sect is a small organized group that separates itself from a larger religious body and asserts that it alone embodies the ideals of the larger group because it alone understands God's will. We, whoever we are, are the sons of, dar of light. You, whoever you are, are the sons of darkness. We are the correct ones. Everybody else, uh-uh, sorry. You should do tshuva and you should join us. And when does this situation begin? We don't have such a situation in the time of first temple and the time of the Bible. We have sinners, we have people who do idolatry, and we have prophets, but we don't have this idea that this one believes he's right and this one believes he's right. We, it, it's all not completely clear, but it seems that the beginnings of this sectarianism is around the time of the story of Hanukkah, and that's why I put this nice Hanukkah here. Why? Because as much as the, the Hasmoneans save Judaism, right, they also do certain things that are considered illegitimate by other Jews. Number one, they're very Hellenized. Number two, they take on themselves uh, the kingship, except that they are not from the house of David. Number three, they point themselves to be the high priests, even though they're not from the correct family, from the correct genealogy. Okay? So you have these Hellenized priests who are not supposed to be high priests, who are doing things in the temple and are making it more corrupt. We don't like that. And so there are groups that break away, the Sadducees, the Essenes. They are not happy with what's going on. And you get these different groups, all of whom believe that they are the real Jews. They are the true Jews. Now, what are the focal points of separation? Okay, we're going to see one of the biggest ones is the temple and how you keep the laws in the temple. Um, how you interpret the law, right? How do you keep Shabbat? How do you keep purity laws? Um, how do you interpret the texts? One of the, the slurs in the sectarian world works about other Jews is that they are doresh chalakot. They are seekers after smooth things. They're smooth talkers, right? They're sharp talkers. But that might be just a play on words of doresh halachot. They are ex ex doing exegesis of the laws, but it's not really. It's just a smoothness. It's just kind of getting out of the laws and what we're supposed to do. How do you actually separate? Okay, so probably the most important way to separate one group from another is is by having a different calendar. Okay, uh, and what you see in the picture here on the left is a very elaborate sundial that was discovered in Qumran. It's not just a regular sundial, but it's a sundial with all these concentric circles. We think it's a, uh, a sundial that can be used throughout the year as the sun changes position. Um, the Essenes, the, the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls, have a completely solar year. Okay. Jews, as we know uh, today, have a, have a lunar year that is modified by a solar year, right? We have a lunar year of 354 days where we add days every, uh, we add a month every few years. Uh, they have a completely solar year, 364 days. Their holidays always fall out on the same day of the week. Having a different calendar is probably the best way that you can separate yourself from your co-religionists. Okay? Think about Christianity. You have Eastern Orthodox Christ Christmas. You have Armenian Christmas. When you're not celebrating together, you are separating yourself. And think about the extremely important story in the Mishnah and Rosh Hashanah. Okay, one of the very few stories, the mission doesn't tell us a lot of stories, right? Mishnah tells us a story about how Rabbi Yoshua says that the new moon is on a certain day and Rabban Gamliel and the Sanhedrin proclaim it on a different day. And Rabbi Yoshua is following his calendar and Rabban Gamliel sends him a message and he says, 
on the day that you calculate as Yom Kippur, which I calculate as a weekday, you are to come to me with your staff and your money bag, meaning you are to publicly show that you are not keeping Yom Kippur according to your calculations. Is Rabban Gamliel necessarily right? No, but he under in his calculations, no, but he understands that once you have a separate calendar, that leads to division. Okay, so calendar is very important. Purity is very important, right? You uh, and we, we see this all over the place in uh, in the Mishnah and the Gemara. The people who are careful about purity, right? The Chaverim and the people who are less careful about purity. And the people who are less careful are not going to eat with the people who are careful and they're not going to buy. The, the people who are careful are not going to eat with them and they're not going to buy food from them, right? Going to the mikvah, how often you go to the mikvah, how careful you are about your dishes and your food. That's another significant um, way to split your, your groups, okay? Now, we're saying this is happening all over the place. Are the rabbis talking about it? Do we hear about it? We have so much rabbinic literature. Are the rabbis talking about these people? Um, so the bottom line answer, even though we're going to read a few texts, is that the rabbis are the inheritors of the Pharisees, of the Prushim, and they are the winners. Okay, They're the winners in this story. The winners don't have to talk about the losers. They could, but they don't have to, because the winners basically are saying, we are the true Jews, and they really are, because there's nobody else around. Right? So the rabbis rarely mention other groups. We do have a little bit of talk about the Sadducees, about these guys named the both Bothusians, the Baitosim, who might be a variation on the Sadducees. We have these intimations like the story of Rabbi Yoshua and Rabbi Gamliel about potential divisions. We don't hear about the Essenes. We hear about a group called the Chitzonim. Maybe they're the Essenes, but really very, very, very little. Okay, just to give you two examples where we hear about the Sadducees, okay, the Mishnah and Yadaim. Okay, it just talks about purity. The Sadducees say, we complain against you Pharisees because you say the Holy Scriptures defile the hands, but the books of Homer do not defile the hands, right? Uh, a Torah scroll will make you impure, but the books of Homer won't make you impure. What, what kind of crazy thing is that? Why would the Torah make you impure? Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, of course, very important Pharisee sage, said, have we nothing against the Pharisees but this, right? He's making fun of them. They say the bones of a donkey are clean, yet the bones of Yochanan the high priest are unclean. They said to him, according to the affection for him, so is their impurity, so that nobody should make spoons out of the bones of his father or mother. He said to them, so also are the Holy Scriptures, according to the affection for them, so is their uncleanness. The books of Homer, which are not precious, do not defile the hands, right? It's a very nice rabbinic discussion. And it's one of the few places where we hear this kind of a distinction between what the Sadducees believe and what the Pharisees believe, by the way, in a very classic topic, purity, impurity, not, nothing, uh, nothing out there, nothing so unusual. Okay, the other perhaps more famous example is the Mishnah Menachot, where we hear about this incredibly elaborate ceremony of cutting the Omer, right, of cutting the first grains, uh, according to the Pharisees, on the second day of Passover, Okay, mean Maharat HaShabbat, according to the Sadducees and the Essenes as well, by the way, Maharat HaShabbat, the day after the Sabbath is Sunday. Okay, and their calendar always makes it fall out on Sunday. You always do it on the first Sunday after Pesach. But the Pharisees say no, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, any day of the week, the day after Pesach. So what would they do? How would they reap the Omer? They would go to the out on the day before the festival, tie the unreaped grain in bunches, all the inhabitants of the town assembled. As soon as it became dark, he says to them, has the sun set? And they answer, has the sun set? And they answer, right? You have this calling back and forth, back and forth, right? It's like a gospel congregation. Is this on this Sabbath? Yes. On this Sabbath? Yes. Shall I reap? right? Ktsor, ktsor. Do it, do it. Why do we say it so many times? Look at the bottom. Because of the Bothusians who held that the reaping of the Omer was not to take place at the conclusion of the first day of the festival. So this is a polemic to say this is what we're supposed to do on this day and not on the day that you say. Okay, we will come back to the sectarian differences. Let's take a look at Qumran. Okay, Qumran is the site below the caves. Okay, um, Already in the 50s, there's an understanding that if there's stuff in the caves, there's probably stuff before, below the caves. Uh, and they start to excavate here. Now, of course, again, this is under Jordanian control. So this is not excavated by Israel in the beginning. Okay? Um, this is a plateau. Qumran is on a plateau. Perhaps uh, it's a place for prayer. Okay. Uh, 
one of the things, this is what I mentioned to you before, you can see it very nicely in the satellite picture that we're on the cliffs, right? And you come down from Jerusalem and then you are here on the top of the cliffs, very uh, inaccessible. However, with water nearby, because otherwise they could not survive, okay? Two sources of water, uh, a few kilometers uh, on the road, you have a natural spring, uh, a sweet water spring named Ein Feshcha. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, uh, the residents of Qumran, like Herod does at Masada, a few hundred years, a hundred years later, they figure out how to trap water that's flowing through the desert from flash floods, right? Coming from the mountains around Jerusalem, flowing down towards the Dead Sea. They figure out how to trap it. And we have a little piece of this aqueduct that's still left that leads the water directly into cisterns, directly into the ritual baths, the mikvaot that they have here, of which they have many, right? So they're taking advantage of the water sources that are there. The Archaeologists who are excavating here are um, Bible scholars who are Dominicans, right? French Catholics, uh, part of the Ecole Biblique in Jerusalem. That's the, the picture that you see here uh, on the right. Uh, and the person in charge is the gentleman with the beard, Roland DeVoe. Um, and they are very, uh, very reputable Bible scholars. But again, we are coming at this from a Christian point of view as opposed to a Jewish point of view. And it's only after the Six Day War that Jews have access to this site. What do we have here at the site? This is a nice uh, sign from, uh, from the time period. I mean, from the, from the site, okay? Uh, first of all, the blue is the water in the aqueducts, in the cisterns, flowing into the mikvaot. Okay, so those are all important to understand. Uh, we are going to take a look at a few of these sites. Okay, we're going to take a look at, well, first of all, you have a guard tower, right? Because they're out in the middle of the desert, they need to protect themselves. Okay, uh, the scribes room, very important. We're gonna take a look at that. Um, the refectory or the dining room. Okay, what we don't have at the site, what was not discovered at the site, first of all, are the scrolls, which are in the caves above, okay? We don't see where they slept. They slept presumably also in the caves because we haven't found anywhere that would show that there were like living quarters, okay? Um, what, the other thing you don't see here are the toilets. They used the, they, they did not have any kind of way to relieve themselves in the camp. They went outside the camp to do that. And that's part of their whole purity issue. And the cemetery, which is also outside the camp. All you have here are the public buildings, right? And that's what you had uh, in the site, the communal buildings, the public buildings. Remember, they're living a communal lifestyle. So that makes sense, okay? Um, the timeline here, we have some remains here from First Temple times, nothing very significant, a cistern, some handles. The main time period is two different parts broken up by an earthquake and a fire. Uh, the beginning of the settlement in Hasmonean period, right? Second century BCE earthquake and fire, the site has to be resettled. And then they come back the end of the first century BCE and they are here until the great revolt when the war that they have predicted is gonna happen indeed does happen, only it doesn't happen quite as they thought it would. And then we have another short period of settlement uh, in the Bar Kokhba era, but that's already not part of our story. That's a different story altogether. How do we know these dates, right? Besides the fact that we have the scrolls, we have many coins that were discovered here. Okay? Uh, we have pottery, the mikvaot are from this the same style. The dates are pretty clear that we know when it's from, okay? We have evidence of this earthquake. Okay? We hear about the earthquake in, in literary sources, but we also have evidence of it. Take a look at this picture on the left, the steps going down to the mikvah, which are um, uneven, okay? They're kind of broken in half. Um, and we also know that there were a lot of fires at this site and the fires make sense because all of these buildings, we don't see roofs today because the roofs were made out of organic material, right? They're usually made out of wood, out of straw. And you would keep a fire, a lamp burning all the time because it was very hard to make fire in the old days. And it's a very, very windy site. The wind catches hold of one of these lamps, catches hold of the roof, and that's it. So fire is a, is a pretty common 
thing that's going to be happening around here. We have found lots of coins, okay? One cache of 561 coins discovered together, other coins separately. Um, and this tells us, proves to us what Josephus says, right? This is a community that pools its wealth. It's very much a kibbutz, right? Or a monastery, however you want to look at it, whatever your terms are. You would join the community and we know from their works that you would have to given money in order to join you had a trial period a very long trial period by the way a few years until you were completely accepted and the treasure belonged to the community uh, and one of the suggestions by the way what was the appeal of this community besides you know the ideological fervor there were hard times there were years of famine and you knew that if you came out here if nothing else you would get fed right twice a day as opposed to if you stayed on on your farm where there was no food so that might have been the appeal that the the, the community had a lot of money. Okay, the picture on the right here is a very unusual scroll that was discovered. It's called the Copper Scroll. Okay? Uh, it's, in, it's in Jordan today. It's written on metal uh, and it describes, it's, it's not a biblical scroll. It's one of these sectarian texts and it describes a huge treasure. It's basically a treasure map and, and it gives directions how to get to it. And the question is, is this a real treasure map? Is it allegorical? There was a, a very um, maverick archaeologist named Vendel Jones who tried to find the treasure. So far, it has not been found. Um, the most exciting part of the site, for, for us certainly, but I think for everybody, uh, is the area where the scrolls were written. Okay, And this is called the Scriptorum. Today, you see it here on the left. It doesn't look particularly exciting. But when it was discovered, okay, they discovered tables, benches, inkwells. This is the place where the texts are written. Okay. Um, and you can see right next to it um, is another smaller room, which has these kind of interesting niches in the wall where we think scrolls were kept, sort of like a library. Okay. Uh, and this brings us to a very significant question. Why are they writing these scrolls, right? Why are they writing them? Why are they bringing them out here? What's the idea? So perhaps they feel so alienated from Jerusalem that they want to have their scrolls with them here. They don't want to go back to Jerusalem. Perhaps they know, uh, and they do know because they believe it in their end of days prophecies and their eschatology, that trouble is coming. And indeed, trouble is coming, not the kind that they thought it was. Or perhaps, and this is a very intriguing idea, they are so obsessed with purity. What are scrolls written on? They're written on animal skins. And maybe they believe that the animal skins should not be in the holy city of Jerusalem because they could have impurity because they are a living skin. For whatever reason, it seems they write the scrolls here and they put them for safekeeping into the caves. Um, one last place that we'll look at in the in the site itself is this large rectangular room, which is called the refectory or the dining room. Why do we think it's a dining room? Because the room right next door is a large pantry where we found all sorts of pottery dishes. So we assume that the dishes are next door to the dining room. That makes sense, right? The china closet is near the dining room. Uh, and we know from Josephus, that they eat together. Eating together is a very significant thing for them. According to Josephus, they eat together in silence, okay? And according to their texts as well, okay? We have texts called the rule of the community that talk about life in the community and all the things you should not do, okay? One of which is speaking without being called on in the meal. And what's fascinating is that everything that you should not do carries the same punishment, okay? There's an overseer, uh, we would perhaps call it a mashgiach, right? Someone who's in charge of the moral development of the community. And his job is to punish anybody who is, does not follow the rules. The punishment is always the same, only in varying degrees. You get less food. It's a very Jewish punishment, right? You get less food. You can't eat with everybody in the communal dining room, depending on how bad what you've done is, right? You could get less food for a day, for a week, for a month. You could be barred from eating with everybody. But eating together is very much a part of their sacred space, of their ritual. Now, here's a fascinating thing. Based on the size of this dining room, right, uh, and based on the average size of people, it fits around 200 people. And that makes sense that 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 would be 
at any given time the population of this commune, of this group. But what's fascinating is that in the pantry next door, there are remains of more than 800 dishes. Why do I need 800 dishes for 200 people? Because they have different courses. And that's where you get to something fascinating. Who has different courses in their meals? Not poor people, right? Different courses in their meals is something that wealthy people have, that Greeks have in what's called a symposium. Our Passover Seder is based on a Greek symposium where you have different courses and you have different things that you do at different times. These guys so want to get away from the Hellenizing and the corruption of Jerusalem and of, and, uh, and of the Greek culture that's there, but you can never completely get away. The culture comes with you all the time. Um, okay, one controversial question. Um, Josephus talks about them as celibate, as not getting married. Um, however, in their texts, there are some texts that seem to imply that there were families, that there were women. In the archaeology, they have discovered a few things that seem to indicate that there were women at Qumran, combs, men are not such hair combers, certainly not in ancient times, jewelry, and perhaps most incontrovertibly, in the cemetery, they found skeletons that belonged to women. So this is a, another one of the questions that's really unanswered. Um, did they have women there? Were the women there in a specific capacity? Were there some Essenes who were married and some who weren't? Uh, an open question, right? But we want to go back to the literature a little. What do the scrolls tell us about the sect? So we have different types, and this is now only talking about that third category, right? Only talking about the sectarian works. We have books of rules, okay? The rule of the covenant, it's called Sarah Hayachad in Hebrew, the Damascus covenant, laying out what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, things you can do on Shabbat, right? Things you can do in the in the communal dining hall, right? Where you're allowed to go to the bathroom, right? Very much going into every detail of their lives. So that's the sectarian rules. Um, you have what are called pisharim, right? Pesher, uh, commentaries on books of Tanakh, which are basically a cryptic history of the sect, right? When you talk about, you know, the evildoers in the Nevi'im, they interpret it con connected to their history. As Professor Hanan Eshel, Zichron uh, Sadiq Livracha, is a very uh, good scroll scholar, important scroll scholar, says you would have to be an FBI cryptologist to really understand what's going on in these, in these texts. But there definitely are hints at conflict with the people in the temple and the people in Jerusalem. There is prayer and poetry. They wrote many, many different kinds of prayers. Uh, for example, every Shabbat, every Shabbat of the year, there is a different specific prayer, right? Very beautiful, actually. Okay? Um, they have biblical texts that they rewrite in their own way, the Temple Scroll, and they have works of eschatology, of the end of days, okay? What's going to happen? 